Okay, so we are ready. So yeah, let's get started. So Audrey, so it's an honor to finally meet you in person. So I'm Shin Murakami, LinkedIn Japan country manager with an engineering background. So since COVID-19, so you have appeared a lot of Japanese media. I think uh, it's your humor and the gentle smile so during such a tough time, so you know, uh, that have made you such a hit with us. So today, I'd like to introduce you to more people with our friends from around the world at the Business Insider, the first ever global conference. Yes, of course. Um, I'm happy to answer any and all of your questions. So I heard that so the Taiwanese government implementation to the COVID-19 attracts a lot of attention. I think the key uh, to the Taiwanese model of success was about being open throughout uh, and the open development environment an open platform symbolized by Gov Zero uh, and the attitude on the open government itself, mm -hmm. even before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I also heard that anyone can visit your minister's office uh, mm -hmm. every Wednesday. So mm -hmm. why is it so important for you to be so open? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for the great question. I think a very important one, which is why open is so important mm -hmm. uh, to my philosophy. Um, actually, I'm here not only Wednesdays, uh, although I have to go to cabinet meeting every Thursday, I'm usually in the cabinet on Mondays, well, the other days people can just visit me um, when I'm here and the only thing I ask is that we publish everything online as either transcript or a video recording. And the reason is that the radical transparency makes sure that people, when they lobby me, lobby only on the basis of public interest and not their uh, selfish interest because they know everybody else is watching. And the reason behind this philosophy is what we learned during open source development. There's a saying that says, and I quote, when there are enough eyes, all bugs are shallow, unquote. That is to say, when you get people from various different positions looking at a idea together, the uh, problems, uh, the inconsistencies and so on in the idea, uh, there's bound to be somebody discovering it. So it serves like a collective intelligence system. So I don't have to rely on my own pairs of eyes to look at all the uh, possible problems with any proposal. Rather, people in different positions can help to soothe out uh, the problems uh, in any proposal and build common values because people trust each other to only add to the conversation without attacking each other because it's all public. Very interesting. So this famous story of B Taiwan, so a platform for dialogue between citizens and the government. So what would you say a uh, critical role of IT and digital in building this platform? And what role does the open source community play there? And what are some of the things uh, that can be only be possible offline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the question about why is digital so important is that digital allows us to transcend the boundaries of space and time. For example, we are not in the space um, now, right? But through digital technology, we can still meet face to face mm. and see each other very clearly, actually more clearly than we uh, have to face face-to-face -face meetings because we have to wear a mask if we're actually face-to-face. -face. Uh, and so uh, this um, breaks the space boundary. And also if people uh, are in different time zone and they cannot uh, wake up to participate in a live streaming, they can watch the recording and do a asynchronous way of uh, maybe comment and reply to nevertheless voice their opinions without having to uh, stay awake uh, regardless of their time zone. So it also makes asynchronous communication possible that breaks the time boundary. Uh, so that's why digital is important. On the other hand, all of this goes through intermediation. And if the intermediation is biased, for example, uh, if sometimes people don't have the bandwidth required to participate in live streaming, or they don't have access to such devices, or if the live streaming uh, platform only uh, favors certain operating systems or devices and excludes other operating system or devices and so on, then it creates a imbalance in the right of participation, which is why broadband as a human right and also mm. vendor neutrality is so important when making democratic innovations. And finally, what are the things that can only be done face to face? Well, definitely enjoy food 
and drink together. Uh, even though we can enjoy the same music together now, uh, it's very easy actually. Um, the food and drink is actually much harder. But when I uh, work uh, with Silicon Valley companies before uh, becoming a digital minister, uh, they will send me, for example, uh, wine, red wine from the Napa Valley. So we will, in a video conference, open the same bottle of wine and drink together. Uh, or they go to their Golden Beers and I go to the Golden Beers in Taipei uh, and so on. So nevertheless, uh, enjoy some sort of uh, familiarity, but it's not a substitute for the actual food and drink uh, in face-to-face uh, -face settings. So let's talk about the technology. So mm -hmm. AI uh, has become a huge part of mm -hmm. our everyday life. So regarding mm -hmm. data utilization, oh, and how and where to utilize such a powerful technology is key for us. So mm -hmm. I know so Taiwanese government achieved a huge success of the tech and the politics. So usually don't mix well, right? So mm -hmm. where do you think the area for tech to shine is in the future? Uh, plus, mm -hmm. how should we set the agenda uh, to mm -hmm. tackle the issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always call AI assistive intelligence. Uh, so to your question of why AI works well with democracy in Taiwan, that's because just like any assistant, you have to make sure that the assistant that you hire works according to your best interests. It's called value alignment. And also, whenever they make a decision that you're not comfortable with, you will demand an explanation from the assistant that's called accountability. So if there's value alignment and accountability, that the entire society can shape the norm upon which that the AI enters the society, then we can trust the AI as we trust some of our assistants. But on the other hand, if they fail to provide the account or fail to align for value, then that AI will not be symbiotic. It will be parasitic uh, with the society. Then, of course, the society will just say no uh, to that particular use of AI because it's not assistive anymore. So thinking AI not as artificial but as assistive is very important. Mm -hmm. Great. OK, let's move on to the next question. So. Uh, the current Taiwanese government is actively hiring the younger people. So you are 35 years old when you became the Minister of Digital Affairs in 2016. So I also read about the Taiwan's reverse mentorship uh, mm -hmm. in which cabinet ministers appoint mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneur and the social innovator under mm -hmm. the age of 35 as reverse mentors. So yeah, I'm very surprised uh, of that. So what are your thoughts on the importance of incorporating the power of young people mm -hmm. into organization, uh, both in politics and in business. Yeah, if you are under 35 years old, that means that you are a digital native. By the time that you uh, learn to read and write, it's already reading and writing on a computer. Uh, I am a digital immigrant. I'm not a digital native. I uh, <laughs> learned about internet when I was 12 years old. So I'm a young immigrant, but I'm still an immigrant. Uh, and uh, for digital natives, uh, the solution set is not something that is top down. Uh, they always think about working in crowdfunding, in crowdsourcing, in just getting people interested in a hashtag, and they very quickly trust each other. Uh, it's called swift trust. Uh, with just a single hashtag, people can mobilize and start doing very useful social productions without having to spend a lot of time meeting face to face. So it's a radically different way of social organization um, as compared to people who are digital migrants. And because of that, the younger people see more possibilities to get the social, the environmental, and the business sectors working together, while the people who are not digital natives tend to think in more siloed way. And so for me, I think younger people need to point the directions of future where the society is evolving, and the people who are older need to support them with the resources that they need. Hmm. It's interesting. So what's the potential of millennials uh, and Generation Z for society, and how do you manage to rally their support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the other way around. I support them. They don't have to support me because they are the future. They point out the direction. Uh, and in Taiwan, even for people who are just 16 years old, uh, who campaign, for example, to ban the plastic straw for bubble tea, uh, because they don't want the plastic to pollute the sea, right, the ocean, uh, even without the right to vote, 
they can get many people into this e-petition and start a social movement. And it's not just in Taiwan, right? You see uh, that in other like European countries, the students refuse to go to school on Fridays because they care about climate change because they will suffer more uh, uh, from climate change than either of us will, right? Because they will live uh, to a more uh, climate changed future. Uh, and so I think uh, a more important thing is that even before they have the right to vote, we need to enable them with, for example, participatory budgeting rights, deliberation rights on policy making, proposing sandbox regulations and laws, uh, and engaging in presidential hackathons, starting e-petitions, and so on, and which are all uh, empowering disenfranchised people, that is to say people who couldn't vote um, because they were not yet at the uh, voting age. Uh, and so the more that they are included in the decision-making process, especially when it concerns to their own welfare, the more that they will participate in the democracy when they actually become uh, 18 or 20 years old. And if they don't have a good experience participating, then by the time they're 18 or 20, they wouldn't care about politics anyway. Uh, and so we start even when they're like six years old or five years old, there's uh, some kindergartner uh, in Taiwan working with their parents um, to uh, petition and also to campaign for diversifying the parks so that it's more inclusive with people with varying abilities and so on. And that is also a very nice uh, social movement. Back when I was uh, 13 or so, I also went to the streets um, to uh, campaign for uh, education reform. And all that reinforces that participation really makes a difference. And so it's also part of education. Mm, great. So what do you think is important when it becomes to leadership in this era? Yeah, I think, uh, as I said, value alignment and accountability is not only important for AI developers, but also for leaders as well. A leader needs to prove uh, in real time that we are accountable to all the decisions that we're making, that we're really answering uh, the people's common values and not just hiding behind for example, quarterly reports and so on. So a very responsive accountability is important. And also when I say value alignment, nowadays, even for businesses, the value is not just shareholder value, but also stakeholder value. That is to say, one needs to take care of the environment for the next generation or the social um, configuration, because even if your shareholder earns a lot of money, if the planet gets destroyed two generations down the line, that money means nothing, right? Uh, and so sustainability, uh, inclusion, all are very important value to be aligned uh, for a leader uh, today. Thank you so much. So yeah, alignment uh, is so important for everyone. So let's move on to the next topic. So we'll touch a little bit about the inclusion and yeah, uh, thinking uh, others yeah, hurts. So diversity inclusion is uh, an essential piece for modern management. So mm -hmm. would you be able to elaborate uh, on that through mm -hmm. your experiences? Yeah, certainly. Uh, there's a saying that says, and I quote, nothing about us without us, unquote. So I already talked about the very young people in the kindergartens. Now I'm going to talk about very old people. My own grandmother is 87 years old uh, and she still uh, works with me. Uh, we talk every week. I visited her every other week uh, to uh, work on policy issues. Uh, for example, Taiwan was able to stave off uh, coronavirus largely because we get three quarter of population wearing masks in a very short time, uh, as soon as end of February. Uh, when we start mask rationing in early February, we understand that many elderly people may not be able to queue uh, in front of the pharmacy for such a long time uh, if they're really old. So uh, starting in March, we started working on ways for them to pre-order the mask uh, from the kiosk in the convenience store. And so uh, my grandma uh, not only helped reviewing uh, this plan, but also introduced her younger friends uh, who are like 77 years old, so younger uh, to her, but not to me, uh, to work as focus group uh, to make sure that, uh, for example, we initially designed when you're going to the convenience store, you, you will use the ATM, the automated teller machine, to both pay for the mask and also uh, confirm your identity. 
but then the 70 year old um, grandmother uh, Yang told me uh, told me that uh, she isn't comfortable because she have to type uh, her uh, bank card uh, passport mm -hmm. and so she was afraid that this will transfer not uh, only like 52 uh, NT dollars but actually 50,000 uh, NT dollar <laughs> uh, to some other account so we eventually decoupled uh, the authentication and the payment so she will authenticate without having to enter a password using her health insurance card and then she can pay with cash uh, over the counter uh, and initially we designed it for a, a mobile phone scanner but she actually has a difficulty in seeing uh, and so she used a very large tablet and so we also worked so that the scanner works uh, with large tablets as well so the more you include the elderly into the public service design the more likely that those services will actually be used and once they learn about it they can also teach other younger people like the 70 year old can then teach 60 year olds right uh, and so that uh, becomes a social uh, mobilization so by the time of april more than 95 percent of taiwanese people not only have access to a mask but know how to use it properly and that's when our r value uh, went below one it's uh, yeah composition and uh, and uh, taking care of others is uh, so important so yeah uh, grandma is a struggle to yeah, use something so yeah we know so then yeah we quickly yeah, fix the issue though so, right like an open source community or engineering community yes yes the point is the uh, short uh, iteration it's not mm. how how good your decision is it's how quickly you can pivot if it's not mm. great so yeah, we both have the engineering background, right? So, but uh, we know there is still a noticeable gender gap uh, in the tech world, especially, so including the lack of women uh, in the in industry. What do you think can be done to make the industry more diverse? So, mm -hmm. and how do you think women and minorities can mm -hmm. be promoted in the tech industry? Well, in Taiwan, software engineering is very gender balanced, and it has been that way since I was a, a teenager. So we, we don't actually suffer from that problem. But no. uh, we can say uh, that it's also because, because we have other uh, engineering fields, and there are uh, gender imbalance in those engineering fields, but not in software engineering. And I think uh, one of the reasons is that we don't call software engineering engineering. In Taiwan, it's called program design. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the programmers are designers. They are not engineers. And designers mm -hmm. are gender balanced. And actually, if you are a LGBTIQ plus person, as a designer, you're actually uh, seeing things from an even more uh, empathetic perspective. So it's a plus for a designer, but not necessarily so for an engineer. And so by calling programmer designers instead of engineers, it also works with this AI age because in AI, it's not about writing code to produce data. It's about curating data to produce code. Uh, and that makes uh, the data collection, that is to say, uh, interfacing with people more important than interfacing with machines. Uh, and so that's more of a design thinking mindset. And so I think reshaping the field as a design field, as something that's closer to humans, can actually increase the diversity and also inclusion of participants. You had uh, two adolescents. So how has having two adolescents and being the transgender that affects you. Uh, how did you manage to break free from what society expects one to be how? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, um, I went through two puberties uh, and I think this enabled me to go through these puberties in a way that uh, empathizes uh, with uh, more people. If you only go through one puberty, you will think half of the population shares some experience with you but the other half of the population doesn't share the experience with you. But having gone through pu pu puberty, I don't have this mindset. So for me, everybody shares some experience with me. I don't think half of the population is different from me. And so it enabled me to take all the sides, 
much more readily. And it's not just about gender. For example, I don't belong to any political party. So I don't think that people of certain political party uh, are my comrades and the other ones are my enemies. I don't think that way either. And uh, the same is for nationality, for pretty much anything, right? So in my mind, uh, there is a intersectionality going on whenever people feel that uh, they uh, can see the world through some perspective, I'm willing to learn from that perspective. And I think being transgender also helped me to be transnational, transcultural, and so on. I think that is um, a very good positive effect. And as for what society expects me to be, I think um, whatever other people portray me, that's their creation, right? Uh, that's their remix. Uh, and so I see it as their creative output but I don't identify with other people's label of me, and, and that's it. Um, I think it's uh, a very simple idea in open source development that if somebody fork uh, your project, that become mm. their project, you don't identify with their fork. Uh, and I treat the societal portrayal of me the same. I'm in Japan, so Japan is the world's fastest aging society uh, and infamous for lacking the diversity in leadership, so especially the gender. So how would we create open and honest communication beyond the differences of age and gender? So are there any tips uh, that you could suggest overcoming these yeah, barriers? Yeah, in Taiwan, we have more than 40% of our members of parliament uh, in, as women. Uh, and we didn't get to this point overnight. Uh, we took 12 years of gender mainstreaming, making sure that in each and every government project, uh, that are one year or longer, uh, or any uh, draft law proposed by the government, they have to do a gender impact assessment uh, with a gender equality committee that is guaranteed to be uh, inclusive and diverse, and also uh, have 18 uh, civil society organization seats and 17 uh, ministerial seats. So when they have to vote, uh, the civil society always wins the vote. Uh, and so because of this, uh, all the levels of the government eventually learned the importance of gender mainstreaming in uh, their lines of work. And so when the referenda came, for example, on the marriage of uh, you know, gay and lesbian people, uh, it makes sure that we legalize all the same rights and duties, the bylaws, uh, but also the family to family wedding, uh, that is to say the uh, in-laws relationship does not change. Uh, and so they managed to find this innovative solution that take care of the older generation that see marriage as more a family to family thing, which is not touched by same sex marriage. Mm. Um, and then uh, the younger generation, which sees wedding as more individual to individual thing. Uh, and they create a hyperlink act that take care of both sides of the society. So I think it's important to think beyond the binary differences and focus on the common value, which is the importance of marriage. Okay, so and uh, we are talking about yeah, diversity and inclusion. So I heard that, uh, so now we are talking in English, right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, English is uh, my second language. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mainly speak Japanese. So yeah, yeah, Maybe, yeah, 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 you might, language, yeah, yeah. Speak, yeah, Chinese, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. I heard that, I'm surprised that so Taiwanese uh, government uh, set the law in maybe a two, two years ago, mm -hmm. so uh, called uh, National Languages, so, yes. uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Developing Act. So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, please share the yeah, uh, background or context of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we now have more than 20 national languages, uh, and mo uh, most of which are indigenous, because um, Taiwan is part of the Austronesian uh, linguistic family. Uh, in fact, most of the Austronesian coaches uh, can trace their lineage back to Taiwan. Um, that's uh, all the way throughout Polynesia, all the way to New Zealand, uh, to the Maori people. Um, and so because of that, uh, on the east side of Taiwan, there's many, many cultures uh, that are like orally transmitted, meaning that there's uh, no written history, but people care about preserving the history. Uh, and so now they're uh, more uh, putting them into uh, Latin alphabet and so on. Uh, but uh, because they were Austronesian uh, family, uh, of languages is difficult, if not impossible, um, to use kanji uh, to express it. And so they have to use uh, the Latin characters. Um, and because of that, nowadays in these uh, indigenous nations, 
um, the public service is required if there's, for example, more than half of people in that township uh, speaks uh, Amis uh, or Bunun or Atayal uh, or things like that, the public service need to be provided in that local language as well uh, to show uh, not only respect, but also a transcultural willingness to communicate uh, so that they don't have to uh, express their ideas in kanji, which is very unnatural for their uh, native languages. Uh, on the um, west side of Taiwan, of course, there's also the Taiwanese holo, Taiwanese haka, uh, and also um, Taiwanese sign language, very important uh, for people uh, who cannot hear, right? Um, and so on. So all these are uh, national languages because we believe that the more inclusive uh, a democracy is, the less likely that we will be polarized uh, and get into uh, like very uh, income measurable kind of culture wars. The more inclusive we are, the better the democracy becomes. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to uh, the next topic. So mm -hmm. let's talk about your career. Okay. So yeah, uh, you have a very unique career. So tell us about your career and your life decisions. So you dropped out uh, junior high school mm -hmm. and you started your own business at mm -hmm. 16 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So served as an advisor to Apple uh, while still in Taiwan mm -hmm. and retired uh, mm -hmm. from the business world mm -hmm. at the age of 33. Mm -hmm. So in one interview, you mentioned that mm -hmm. your income is a half of what it used to be. So since you became a cabinet minister. <laughs> so, so mm -hmm. So what have you based your career choices on? Mm -hmm. So it's clear, so it's not about money. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the outline you sent me, you already gave me the answer, right? Uh, you draw a uh, colon and a parenthesis, which is a smiley. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, my uh, career choice. I'm optimizing for fun. Uh, the, the more fun there is, the more likely that I will work on it. Uh, fun is about the enjoyment, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, taking pleasure uh, in knowing that what you work on uh, is beneficial not only to yourself, but also to people who are looking at the similar problems. And also another thing is that uh, if you can save other people time, right? Uh, Larry Wall, uh, one of my mentors, uh, said that laziness uh, is the main virtue of a programmer. We are lazy, so we write programs to save ourselves time. And now if we share this program, then we save everybody time. And that's more fun because we get more time for to spend uh, for doing other things, more creative uh, than automated work, which is what the programs are designed to do, right? Uh, and so um, fun, uh, both personal and also social, and also now global, because we now understand in the social media, uh, if you provide a fun picture, for example, on how to wear a mask to protect you from your own unwashed hands, this is very cute and a lot of fun. Oh. Uh, and then uh, this is our uh, communication material to link mask use and soap use together. And, and this fun actually travels even faster than conspiracy theories uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, anger and outrage based messages on social media. Fun mm -hmm. is actually what travels the quickest uh, in terms of viral marketing. Uh, and mm -hmm. so our central epidemic command center always that's our fun to get uh, their messages across. Uh, and so it's not only individual and communal, but it's also now global idea of using fun uh, to make sure that everybody understands the science of epidemiology, for example. Uh, you look so, yeah, happy and uh, so gender smiling. And uh, mm -hmm. so I feel that you have a soft sense of humor. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah, and the fun and the yeah, essential part for you. Mm -hmm. So what is your secret to this? So how mm -hmm. do you keep uh, this positive attitude? So mm -hmm. how do you enjoy working every day? So what motivates you? So yeah, mm -hmm. please share about that. Yeah, I don't work during the day. I'm just having fun during the day. Um, I don't pass judgments uh, or make decisions during the day. I always take these ideas uh, and then go to sleep. And I work in my sleep and I wake up uh, with a common value or a decision. So uh, I usually sleep eight hours a day, but if there is a very difficult problem, I have to work overtime and sleep nine hours that day. Uh, and so because I work only in my sleep, uh, when I'm waking up, I'm always having fun. <laughs> 
from the yeah, you are young, so yeah, three to eight mm -hmm. hours or nine mm -hmm. hours. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's keep, always yeah. it's always like that. Yes, because otherwise I will have to work during the day, and I cannot have that much fun anymore. Uh, and so uh, you know, eight hour work day uh, to me is eight hour work night. Uh, but it's the same <laughs> principle. Okay, so yeah. I usually yeah three six or seven hours so mm -hmm. now so yeah yeah I yeah I will try. Yeah, maybe you <laughs> have less work uh, than I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your advice. So. Okay, so let's talk about the, yeah uh, Japan. So we are the on the verge a uh, big shift in Japan. So regarding work lifestyle. So yeah, we need to sleep more. So clearly. So, but the one of the biggest issue is that so many people lack confidence. So, LinkedIn did the worldwide research in, uh, and Japan was the least confident among 22 countries. So, we are so used to this old norm, uh, relying on the companies and then not taking charge of our own life choices. So, I agree with your opinion that so everybody should feel like a minority sometimes. So, mm -hmm. but uh, it's hard to accept uh, your own their vulnerability as well. So especially in the workplace. So how could we get away from such a negative thoughts and the behavior just come from this uncertainty uh, and the chaos? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the great way uh, is to just join communities. Um, on LinkedIn, for example, there are many communities based on shared interests. Uh, and then you can discover more people, not necessarily uh, your uh, colleagues or your vendors uh, or your customers. Maybe they are related to you by business, uh, but you're in similar uh, ideas. And so you can join such communities and sh uh, look at them sharing uh, what they learned uh, on their posts uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn. I know many people who use Medium, for example, for this purpose, or Twitter uh, for this purpose, although Twitter is harder to write longer uh, messages. But uh, in the end, it's all about developing a camaraderie so that people don't feel alone in facing the uncertainty and chaos, but rather they can see that people across the spectrum, everybody uh, feel uncertainty and chaos on some of the topics that one cares about. For example, if you are the only one uh, in your community or in your department, in your business uh, to care about climate change, then you can feel very lonely. But if you join such online communities of SDGs, of mitigating against climate change, even if you work in a seemingly difficult uh, situation, you can also learn from the social innovators to, for example, turn your uh, production cycle to use more eco-friendly material or to redesign uh, your work environment so that it generates less waste. Uh, or you can, for example, uh, find new ways to reduce carbon emissions uh, by refilling your water bottle instead of buying plastic bottle and so on. You can encounter many, many ideas that you can then take back to your workplace to use without feeling that you have to uh, be alone in making those changes. And so just solidarity, finding a community, the most important thing. Uh, I think you are on uh, LinkedIn. So yeah, thank you for yeah. using our platform. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it has been uh, helpful to you. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what, uh, how does it influence uh, your mm -hmm. actual work, mm -hmm. do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, useful in two different ways. Uh, one is that, as I mentioned, I get to share what I learned uh, on the LinkedIn community and also find people who are interested in similar things uh, and so on. I think that is as good as um, pretty much any other social media platform, except there's less cute cat pictures. Uh, maybe you can work on that. Uh, but <laughs> so even though it's not as fun as other uh, more fun oriented um, social media platforms. I think the knowledge sharing and the learning part, uh, of course, is there. Uh, and it's as helpful to me as other learning based social media platforms, uh, such as Medium. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is that it also enables me to receive uh, emails uh, from other people. And after each conference and so on, 
I will usually receive many email uh, from people and it enabled me to very quickly check their credentials and check uh, whether they are uh, the person they claim to be uh, and also uh, whether we have common friends uh, so who can do a referral uh, and things like that. Uh, and so it saves me a little bit of time every time everybody send an email uh, because I don't have to spend as much time uh, to check their credentials and their bona fide. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, um, I also uh, received many invitations from many other channels as well. So email <laughs> is maybe just uh, 5% of all my incoming, but for those 5%, uh, I don't have to spend that much time uh, to do due diligence checks. And so thank you for providing that. Lastly, uh, please share so any thoughts to the yeah, mm -hmm. our global mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, nowadays, uh, as we are looking uh, for the physical vaccine, that is to say the mask, finally being accepted uh, as the common thing that everybody needs to do, uh, my main message is still the message of this dog, uh, which is <laughs> very important. That is to say, uh, <laughs> wear a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands because wearing a mask and not washing your hands is actually not very useful at all. Mm -hmm. uh, a mask is only useful if you wash your hands. And this applies <laughs> right. uh, regardless of the material of the mask. Uh, it could be medical mask or from a t-shirt or N95 or whatever. Uh, just every time you touch your mask, remember to wash your hands uh, with soap and alcohol, uh, like hand sanitizers. Uh, and if everybody do that, then we already have a vaccine. It's a physical vaccine. And the world can um, you know, go uh, into a post-coronavirus state much sooner uh, than biological vaccines. Uh, so that's my main message for now. I may have a different message when the biological vaccine becomes generally available. Okay, thank you so much. So yeah, wash your hand and sanitize your hand and mm -hmm. then wearing a mask. So yeah, we got your messages. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah, um, I really enjoyed the conversation mm -hmm. today. Me too. So yeah, Me too. Uh, thank see you, you next yeah. time. Live long and prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.